everyone. I'm Dina. And I'm Charlotte. Welcome to the Grim Curriculum Extra Credit. How the heck are you? I'm doing very well today. It's a rainy Sunday, which is like one of my favorite possible things in the world. And every spare second I have is being consumed by Tears of the Kingdom. So same. <laughs> I think we said that last time too, but it's, I'm still going hard in this game. You know, it's so funny. I really, I've been playing a fair bit. Every like free moment that I have is going to the game, but I haven't done anything. Dude, I just finally was like, okay, I better actually beat these temples and move on with the actual story because if you have ADHD, this game is either the biggest blessing or your worst nightmare. <laughs> oh, are you kidding me? I have done the Wind Temple and that's it. Oh my god. Yeah, there's so much more to do then. All I keep doing is running around and exploring the map. Okay, so Cody managed to get all of the light routes in the underground realm. Like, he has completely discovered all of the underground realm. And I was like, sir... Have you done anything else but play this game? <laughs> I'm kind of jealous, but I also feel like it's going to keep me entertained for a while. I'm happy with it. Yes. Yeah. It's one of those games where I was excited for it to come and it has not disappointed in the slightest. I'm very, very impressed so far. So, and it seems like many, many others out there are enjoying it very much as well. So I'm happy. And also... Uh, not to chat about this too, too much longer, but there's some fantastic fan art out there as well that is just like gorgeous and mind blowing. You know, it's funny because I'm trying really hard to avoid any and all spoilers because I am so far behind. I am avoiding everything with the game. I feel like people have been really good. It's It's one of those games where I find when the general community loves it so much, they tend to kind of keep things to themselves. Um, it was kind of like when I finally saw the end of Last of Us, like the first one. Yeah. It had been out for like eight years already. And finally I saw it and I was like, eight years ago this came out and it was never spoiled for me, not once. That's so impressive. It is. And I hope if you're playing out there that you're enjoying it and having a great time. So yeah. I'll never forget the time that I was playing Red Dead Redemption 2 on stream for the first time. Ugh. And so good. Yeah, some random person came into the chat and spoiled it for me. Oh my god. That is yeah. the most heinous behavior straight to jail with you. That is I horrible. I don't remember who that person is. I remember absolutely nothing about it except for how it happened. But I, I wish them not great things. I mean, I don't wish them bad, but I don't wish them great. <laughs> <laughs> I hope your pillow is always warm, even when you flip it over. Yes. <laughs> Okay, so today for you guys, I have brought a few topics. Um, I went down a bit of a rabbit hole with kind of um, wonderful things throughout history. So we kind of branch off in several different directions. And one of my favorite, uh, I guess, topics in history is weird medical history. I just find it fascinating what humans have done to themselves over I am the years. right there with you and um, I want to just clarify something before we get into this mm -hmm. if you don't mind of course we're going we usually go into our episodes pretty like aware of everything mm -hmm. I'm hearing these stories for the first time friends yes I'm so right there with you we're gonna get a good reaction out of Dina today so our first um topic of today's extra credit is a old a very very old practice uh, medical practice called either trepanning or trepanning and it comes from the greek word tripanon which means a device for boring holes and you may have guessed where this is going already but this grim medical procedure basically meant that they drilled holes into your skull in order to relieve you of whatever was ailing you at the time and this could be Ugh. A number of things. They found the earliest that we've discovered so far was a skull that had been trepanned in a Neolithic burial site in France and is more than 7,000 years old. So we've been um, poking holes in each other's skulls for a while. And this shit goes way back. 
Yeah, they think like it may have had a practical effect to relieve pressure from a head injury. Um, if you guys are familiar at all with the Saw movies, you'll remember the part where they do a craniectomy on Jigsaw. Um, so that is still something that is done today. Uh, it's a little bit different, but basically, uh, yeah, it was either to relieve pressure or to let a trapped demon out of your skull. <laughs> I was about to say, I sure as hell hope it is a more than a little bit different nowadays. But, I would hope uh... so. <laughs> um, there, where was it? Um, apparently, even though this was typically done um, with no anesthetic or anything, you were just held down and someone bored a hole in your noggin. Um <laughs> Although the chances of dying during the uh, quote unquote surgery were quite high due to like shock and stuff like that, if you managed to survive, your uh, chances of surviving successfully were actually really high, which surprised me. Can you imagine like, hey, doctor, I've been feeling a little unlike myself recently. Demons in your head. Literally. Like yeah. <laughs> Back in those days when it was all about, um, whether or not oh what did they call it oh the humors so you mm -hmm. had like wet humors or dry humors and that determined how you were feeling and if you had more than one over the other then you were out of balance and I guess you might need a, a, a hole drilled in your head apparently during the middle ages this was used very frequently one poor soul apparently had some 52 holes drilled in his skull within a oh. two-month period. <laughs> Why? That's so many holes. I don't know, man. It it makes me think of even like the brain surgeries that are absolutely, literally mind-blowing today where they have to do it while you're still relatively cognizant of what's going yes. on. That freaks me out big time. Oh, my goodness. Honest, I feel maybe I've seen way too much Grey's Anatomy, but that's where my head goes. Oh, totally. But also, I can't help but think, like, I would not have survived in this day and age at all. They would have wanted to zap my skull or poke my skull. I don't know, but it would have been bad. Oh, we for sure would have been feminine hysteria and, uh, you know, all that good stuff. Burned at the stake as witches, probably. Guaranteed. <laughs> Um, the I'll wrap up this story with a more modern, I guess, um, instance of this being used. A Dutch guy called Bart Hughes was so convinced of its usefulness that he performed the operation on himself using a local anesthetic, a scalpel, and an electric drill in 1965. Oh my god. So he was convinced of its use. I'm not entirely sure what was ailing him, but yeah, if you want to go look up Bart Hughes that drilled a hole in his head, feel free. <laughs> Can you imagine being that confident in yourself that you're like, I am going to poke this hole in my skull. I got this shit. Oh, man, you have to have a level of confidence in yourself that borders on arrogance, I think. Presumably, he drilled into his forehead because that would have been easier to see in a mirror, I would assume. Oh, Actually, you know what? I'm going to pull him up. Let's, let's yes, see. Yes, please. please. Let's, let's do some quick fact checking. Bart Hughes. Oh, apparently he was a librarian. Uh, yes, so it says he was a Dutch librarian and proponent of trepanation. He did attend medical school at the University of Amsterdam, but was refused, uh, or sorry, refused a degree due to his advocacy of LSD research. And he named <laughs> his daughter, oh my God, this guy, he named his daughter Maria Juana. <laughs> Are you fucking serious right I'm now? Dead serious. Um, oh my god! So he was obviously an uh, an interesting fellow. He thought that trepanation could be used to enhance brain functionality by balancing the proportion of blood and cerebral spinal fluid. Um, I'm not a medical professional. I only have a interest in medical history and whatnot. But I think probably how your body is, is probably how it's meant to be there, buddy. <laughs> you know what? I feel like at the end of the day, at least he wasn't one of those guys that practiced on other people. At least he practiced on himself. Yeah, you know, that is true. Because I feel like a... Um, 
maybe a more cowardly person would have practiced on someone else for sure. I'm thinking Dahmer. My my head goes straight to Dahmer. Oh, absolutely. I mean, how could it not? <laughs> um, but yeah, so that's the brief uh, history of trepanation. And <laughs> I trepanin. love it. Yeah. Let's do... Okay, maybe what we'll do, since the other one I have is also a smidge violent and gory, let's switch to something a little more lighthearted. I have found a list of Victorian slang words that we do not use anymore, or not to my knowledge, and I thought we could go through and I will say them, and maybe Dina can guess what they mean, and then we'll go over it, if that sounds good to you. I'm so excited. I have a glass of wine right now, and I am like <laughs> so prepared to do terribly. So okay. bring it on. Uh, okay, so let's start with... Hmm. I feel like this would have made a great drinking game. Oh, it would too. Well, if you're listening along at home and you have a drink in your hand, drink responsibly. But if you want to take a little sippy sip every time you get one wrong or get one right, you can make up the rules. That's up to you. I'm doing it. <laughs> okay. So the first one is bang up to the elephant. <laughs> <laughs> oh, do I get to hear it in a sentence? Sure. Uh, let me think here. Oh, yes. That motor car was bang up to the elephant. Fancy? Kind of. It means <laughs> perfect, complete, like untouchable. <laughs> I like it. Apparently, it originated in London in 1882. So, yeah, if something is like... Abs so today we might say like, oh, that's slays. <laughs> One of my favorites that is an old one, and I think it came out on TikTok uh, not that long ago that kind of made a recurrence is I've got the morbs, like as in morbid, like I'm feeling under the weather, I'm feeling kind of gloomy. I love that one so, so much. Mm -hmm. I think it's a good one. Some um, days you just got the morbs. Yeah, absolutely. Um, okay, so butter upon bacon. Lots of really good stuff. It means like it's too extra because why would you need to put butter upon bacon? So it's like, <laughs> oh, are you going to put red lipstick on with that look? Oh, you wouldn't want to put butter upon bacon. So like, no, it's too much. That's going too far. <laughs> I don't even know if I'm getting these like right or wrong or like right enough or what. what is you tell me? Okay, well, I would say you're pretty close the first two times. I think I'm yeah, I'm close. Let's see. Oh, this this one's this one's kind of um, you can take it however you want. A fly rink, a fly rink. Yeah, like fly rink, R I N K. That a really cool roller skating rink. <laughs> Not quite. Um, <laughs> it was uh, an 1875 term for someone with a polished bald head. So it was what? like. <laughs> Because it was a rink for flies, because it would oh be all shiny God. and smooth. <laughs> so okay. you'd be like, oh, yeah, did you see Bill? He's got quite the fly rink. <laughs> I, I thought it was like a fly rink. You know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. that's a fly rink. We go roller skating there. Totally. Uh, apparently, also, speaking of rinks, roller skating was very popular with the Victorians. They were very much into it. And you can look up paintings and things like that of people at the time. They don't look the same as they would now. But yeah, apparently the Victorians were all about the roller skating, including Winston Churchill himself. I feel like that would have been a damn good time. I think so, too, especially with how everyone dressed back then. Yes. Okay, this one is make a stuffed bird laugh. So like, ah, oh, that would make a stuffed bird laugh. That is so funny that it would make anybody laugh. Yes, it basically means like it's absolutely preposterous or like it's absolutely hilarious that you would even think that because it would make a stuffed bird laugh. Yeah, I like that one. This one, uh, I feel like I've heard my per my parents or my grandparents say before, but a mutton shunter. <laughs> what? Mutton as in sheep, yeah. like mutton, and then shunter, a mutton shunter. It's a term for a particular career choice, shall we say, a particular profession. <sighs> is it someone that kills them or like takes care of them? It's one way or the other. It actually has nothing to do with animals per se. Oh my god, okay. 
I'm not doing well, you guys. <laughs> To be fair, some of these, I wish um, the list I was using gave me like the etymology behind it because I always find that fascinating. Mm -hmm. But a mutton shunter is a slang term for a policeman. (laughs) (laughs) So I guess it's a little more kind than like pig or something like that, I guess. I love Um, that your parents are using this. I've definitely, yeah, I've definitely heard it before. Not commonly, but I've definitely heard it before. So this one is a parish pickaxe. Oh my. I'll give you a clue. It's in reference to someone's appearance. So you would say like, oh, they have a parish pickaxe. Well, it can't be a good thing, can it? Uh, You know, it, it depends on what you like in a person's face. They have a big nose. A prominent nose, yes. Ah. Yes. So not necessarily a bad thing, depending on what you like to look at, but definitely a prominent nose. I like that. Um, Let's just do a couple more. Oh, this one I liked. So smothering a parrot. Oh, no. Go on. Okay, I will use it in a sentence. What are you doing tonight? Oh, I'm thinking about smothering a parrot. Is that getting drunk? It's drinking a glass of absinthe completely neat. Oh my, that's and intense. It's, it's named like after a parrot because of the green color of the absinthe. Interesting. Yeah, I always like the like stuff around absinthe because it seems so mysterious. You know, they call it like, what is it? Chasing the fairy or whatever. Right? Um, and I've had it and it's not for me personally, but I know some people really like it. I had it once a very, very long time ago and I, I did like it a lot. I think if you do it properly, you know, with the sugar cube and you pour the water over it and everything and like yeah. do the whole experience. I seem to remember back in high school, people just slamming it to get as drunk as humanly possible. So yeah, I don't think that's right. <laughs> you know, two kinds of people. Let's see. What do we have last? Okay, this is another body part, sauce box. (laughs) It's not nearly as spicy as it sounds. Oh my god. Um, Well, a sauce box is a tummy because that is where you hold sauce. (laughs) It is the mouth. Oh, that was going to be my second guess. (laughs) So yeah, there's some fun Victorian slang terms for you. Please feel free to use these in your day-to-day language. I would love that. We got to bring these back. If I can find more, we could definitely make this like a recurring segment on the show, I think. I want Victorian era themed merch. Oh, yes. 100%. I'll add it to the list. I want sauce box stickers. (laughs) It's just like a lovely pair of like blips and a mustache. That's exactly (laughs) what I'm thinking. (laughs) Oh my God. Actually, you know what? My dad has a slang dictionary at his house. I should steal it from them. And it literally has so many slang words from throughout history up to modern day. I'm going to have to grab that and bring it in for this new recurring segment. That is amazing. Okay. What else? Oh, we'll go back to the more... I guess, violent and bloody subject. Um, It's a sport, sort of, that I found out about. Um, This one kind of hits home for me because apparently it originated in the north of England, which is where my family is from. It's an illegal activity called clog fighting. (laughs) Back in the day, in the 19th century clogs literally wooden clogs and oftentimes with a metal sole were used by coal miners factory workers that kind of thing and they were used because they were cheap to make and easy to repair and they were durable and comfortable and clog dancing was also loved as a form of entertainment But when they added the metal capping to them, they became used in a little more threatening manner. Clog fighting, also known as purring, (laughs) was basically, you know, knuckles when you hit each other's knuckles back and forth until someone gives in? Yeah. It's basically like that, except you sit into a large open-ended barrel, (gasps) you sit on the rim, and you basically kick at each other's shins with your clogs on until someone submits. Oh my god. I you know, I thought you were going in a completely different direction with that. I thought you were going to say they like 
sit in the barrel and then people kick them in the butt over and over again. <laughs> it seemed to be one of the rules that you have to be fully naked except for what? your clogs. Yeah. Uh, The guy that's writing this article says, from one uh, newspaper report in May of 1843, tells of a clog fight near Manchester involving two men named Ashworth and Clegg, both in a state of nudity, with the exception of each having on a strong (laughs) pair of boots. Ashworth won, but both were severely injured. (laughs) That, you can't tell me that's not sexual. I, I just, there has to be another way to get out your rage. Because apparently this was often used as like a way to settle disputes, especially over ladies. Or like if someone mm. was caught cheating at card games, they would be like, Kate, let's clog fight about it. The guy that won this particular fight, Ashworth, he actually killed an opponent later on in a shin kicking match. Oh my god. Yeah. And then he emigrated to Australia, but it's not clear whether he went consensually or if it uh, was at Her Majesty's pleasure and he was sent to the penal colonies. So I you know, I kind of understand like the kicking and whatever. You got these metal shoes, you may as well kick each other, but like why are you nude? I have no idea. I researched a little bit more and there was another set of rules that I found that I thought were quite funny. One of the rules was clog fighters are not allowed to kick a man if he's down on the floor, which seems fair Good, enough. Yeah. Dancing to avoid kicks is a key part of it. Oh my God. I don't know if that is also involved with you sitting on the rim of the barrel, like just (laughs) dancing your legs away. I couldn't quite picture it, but the combatants can hold on to each other in some way, usually by their shoulders. And an alternative rule to see who wins is they each hold a handkerchief between their teeth and the loser is the person who drops theirs first. Can you imagine this getting so intense that someone died? I think if you smashed someone's shin, I think that would be your tibia. I feel like the shock of it, or maybe you could bleed to death. I, or yeah. I, you know what? In those days, you could get sepsis from shaving and cutting yourself. So, true, you know. True. But yeah, so that's clog fighting. It was completely illegal, but it wasn't unheard of to bet on the clog fighting matches, too. So usually it happened at like bars and pubs and stuff like that. But. Yeah. I mean, considering last episode, we talked about a guy swallowing knives at bars. So, I mean, the this time doesn't shock me. The time before TV, people were really doing all the things out there to keep themselves entertained. Oh, you got to do what you got to do for those laughs. I guess so. So Dina has one for me. So we're going to switch up for this one and then we'll wrap up with my last one and then our usual wild and wacky death. Yeah, okay, so this one is about Bella Montoya, who, uh, well, she passed away last week, sadly. Okay. Uh, she suffered cardiorespiratory arrest at a hospital in Ecuador. She, you know, she had bit, felt a little sick at home, so they brought her to the hospital, and then she was ruled dead three hours after she was admitted. Okay, I'm trying to, my brain is like, okay. where is this going? <laughs> She spent four hours inside of the casket. They were going to, like, change her clothes and get the viewing ready. Um, It was pretty quick that they were going to have the viewing after she had passed away. And uh, 8.50 p.m., she wakes up. Oh, my God. She starts moving her left hand, and then she opens up her eyes, and then she starts opening her mouth. And you can see the video. This is on video. She's trying to breathe. Oh, my Lord. Uh, So, yeah, so she was declared dead and uh, they had her in the coffin. They were going to get ready to bury her not too long after this viewing. And uh, I'm glad they didn't because she was just out of it sleeping. I don't know. Maybe, you know, she was doing a full system restart in that brain of hers, obviously. Right. Holy cow. I guess they must not have done like an autopsy or, you know, any kind of embalming at that point exactly yeah they just kind of put her away i mean this is in a different country you know things are different but uh they just uh put her away and again really glad that they didn't bury her i'm glad they didn't embalm her 
No kidding. Oh my God. I wonder if, presume, well, it's hard to say, but presumably if she was kept in some kind of morgue where she was kept cooler, it helped her body, you know, because some people, they put on ice while they're healing to help yeah. them, you know, protect their brain and stuff like that while they're healing. Um, So I wonder if it was just the case of, yeah, she needed a, a fucking break and had a quick sleep and then was like, okay, here we go again. What a relief that would be. I mean, it goes to show this has happened throughout history. Like a lot of the mausoleums and stuff in like New Orleans and even, you know, places like the catacombs in France and stuff like that. They have little bells or even phones hooked up just, just in case because it's been known to happen. If I don't get something like that when I die, I at least want to for sure know I'm not being buried. Like yeah. if you're going to bury me, give me a chance to reach out just in case. Please make sure I'm dead, dead. Please make sure. <laughs> Triple check. Yes, please. Oh my God. That, um, I'm not a claustrophobic person by any means, but the idea of being buried alive, I think is a lot of people's worst nightmare. I hate it. I read a really good crime thriller the other day where that was kind of a part of it. It was actually coincidentally based in New Orleans where they do a lot of that stuff. And part of it was the girl gets buried and I was like, nope, don't like this. I would like to move on from this, please. Uh, oh, thank you. <laughs> oh, that just gives me the heebie-jeebies. I don't know. There's a lot of, I mean, obviously any way to die isn't great, but uh, being buried alive, no thanks. Yeah, no thank you. I have to say that uh, that's my contribution for the episode, you guys. Charlotte has done all the work this time around. I feel like one of one of you guys, dear listeners. I'm just like sitting back and reacting. And this is a uh, it's nice, uh, nice little break. Well, you brought the the modern story. I'm bringing the old timey ones, and I think you guys also out there listening enjoy some of the old timey stuff too. Um, what else do we have? Oh, yes. Okay. So the last thing I wanted to bring to the table was the rabbit hole that I went down of weird Olympic sports. And there is some truly odd ones on here. The one, where was it, that caught my attention, I'm just scrolling through, was actually pistol dueling, which you wouldn't think... <laughs> The great Olympic sport of pistol dueling. Yes. It was only staged once at the 1908 Olympics. <laughs> and even then, oh. to be fair, it was in a purely demonstrative capacity. In either case, the affair was highly, highly dangerous. And the competitors donned protective clothing and fired wax bullets at one another. And you had to <laughs> fire them at 20 meters away and 30 meters away. <laughs> oh my goodness. At least the bullets were wax. Yeah, but I mean, I've heard what it's like to be hit by even like a rubber bullet and that's yes. not freaking pl like that can still um break ribs and stuff like that. So, yeah, they basically took pot shots at each other in the name of the Olympics. Hey, you um, got to do what you got to do for sport. 100%. So you guys have heard of synchronized swimming. But have you heard of solo synchronized swimming? No, I have not. And you may be asking yourself, if you're alone, who are you synchronized with? And the answer to that is, I guess, the music. Oh. I don't even think it should be called synchronized swimming. It should be called artistic swimming or, you know, something to that effect. It was introduced in 1984, so a little more modern. And it saw three Olympic rotations before it was removed from competition in 1992. So, Wow. Honestly, though, I kind of love it because that is some dedication to be synchronized all by yourself like that. And you're still going at it. I'm still positively flummoxed on how and obviously there's a great deal of strength and training and skill involved that I could never aspire to but how are you synchronized with one another in the water it's crazy to me and obviously they're wearing goggles and stuff it's a spectacle that I can't wrap my head around it's crazy well imagine just the level of rehearsing that goes into that in because it's all timing they're doing it because they all have the same timing like how amazing is that yeah because surely you can't hear the music Oh, of course not. In the same topic, they thought it was going to be really exciting, but turned out to be incredibly boring, was plunge for distance swimming. It was 
who could dive into the water and while remaining motionless, glide the furthest as you could for 60 seconds. Initially, people thought that the diving would be very like spectacular and exciting, but then you're just waiting 60 seconds while a patient or a patient, (laughs) while a, what is the word even? An Olympian, uh, just sort of- Athlete? An athlete. Thank you. Oh my God. Um, while they just they lay dead in the water <laughs> for 60 seconds. Once again, it only lasted one rotation in 1904, <laughs> and American William Dickey took home the gold. Good for him. <laughs> I think you'll enjoy this one. Only once, again, at the 1900 Games in Paris, the Olympic event of poodle clipping took oh, place. Yes. So there was 128 competitors and they were judged not just on style, but basically who could trim the most poodles in two hours. Oh my God, I love it. So they weren't even judged on technique or anything. It was just, okay, who can clip them the fastest? Oh, these poor poodles probably came out looking terrible. If you're wondering, the poodle clipping champion was Avril Lafou, who clipped... 17 poodles in two hours. Um, This one, apparently it was very, very famous with Henry VIII all the way back in his day, but it's called uh, Jus de Pomme, and it's also known as Real Tennis. Originally, Jeu de Pomme was played without rackets, so it's tennis, but you hit the ball with your open hand instead. Oh my god. Um, but the kind of, I quote unquote, more modern version, the, the one Olympic appearance in 1908, they didn't really have the indoor facilities needed to accommodate the game. So it just never happened again. <laughs> that sounds so painful. I think you would really have to toughen up your your skin like your hand would be calloused. Oh, my God. I just picture like people that have giant hands that are like baseball gloves that are just like whoop just whacking them across. And I think it was played on a wooden court as well. So it would have been almost like squash kind of, I think, or racquetball. The last one we'll wrap up with, and this one I think is really sweet. Once more, only once at the 1900 Paris Olympics. And that was hot air ballooning. Oh, that sounds disastrous. The Olympic Committee basically took a chance on this and they allowed a demonstration to happen, but it was never spoken of ever again. So clearly it didn't go all that well. I think it could be a fun addition to the modern games. I know nothing about hot air ballooning, but I think it would be cool to see. I'm just glad that they're trying new things. Yeah, like what's what's a sport or event or something that you would like to see at the modern olympic games because they are adding a lot more like skateboarding has become really popular the last couple of times around pole pole dancing yeah yeah i don't know if it was introduced but they were certainly talking about introducing it i want to see more people fighting (laughs) just in general (laughs) like on tight ropes and i don't know just like more of that go back to basics I agree. I I want to see. see I don't want to see people fighting animals because it always like ends badly for the animals. But I'll see a guy fight another guy if the other guy's dressed like a lion. For me, there's two things I'd like to see happen with the Olympics that are just like fantastic. Uh, One is I think there should be an average person for reference on every single sport, just trying their best. (laughs) Absolutely. (laughs) Because I think some of these times you're seeing these human beings that are at the pinnacle of fitness whatever that is for their sport and you you sit at home watching from the tv and you're like yeah I could fucking do that sir let me assure you no you could not shoot a shot put 30 fucking meters or whatever right so I want to see someone that looks like me with my level of fitness try some of these things that I'd love that Um, The other thing I would like to see, and this is from um, one of my favorite comedians, Tommy Tiernan, Um, I think there should be a version of the Olympics where everyone is allowed to do whatever performance enhancing drugs they want to. And let's just see how far we can go with this. I would also approve of that. I mean, that just sounds like a great time. I want to see someone yeet a javelin 600 meters. Like, come on. (laughs) Right? I, I would love to watch that. Ah, oh, but anyway, so that's some fun medieval historical medical Olympic 
clog fighting and Victorian slang word facts for you, as well as um, a lady that was lucky enough to come back from the dead and survive it, I guess. I hope she's doing well. I hope so, too. Those were some great, great stories. I love those. (laughs) Thank you. All right, friends, so we're going to be ending this episode like we always do with another strange death. And we are taking it back, but not too far back. We're going back to September 15th, 1983 Okay. uh, to the story of Dick Wertheim. Okay, I'm not familiar with this one. Hit me with it. Okay, well, you see, Dick was a tennis lineman. One day during a game, a ball struck him right in the groin and he fell out of the chair and he hit his head and he died. Oh my God. What person in a past life did you piss off that that was your untimely demise? Right? How terrible is that? Oh my goodness. Oh, that poor man. It's kind of funny that his name was Dick, though, and he went out that way. (laughs) I know. Honestly, I didn't want to say it, so I'm glad that you did. But yeah, I agree. Oh, poor guy. That is not the last thoughts that want to go through your head before you hit your head and pass away. So I'm so sorry, Dick. Right? Like, ow, my dick. And then you die. (laughs) I'm so sorry. Oh, I, uh, yeah. (laughs) I'm just like, did, were you horrible to women in a past life? And God was like, "Mm, you know, punishment has to come some way or another. Right? Like, did you make puppies sad? We should, we shouldn't victim blame. We shouldn't victim blame. (laughs) R.I.P. Dick. Oh, yeah. That's probably what he thought too, right before he died. Um... Oh my god. I'm so sorry. Um... <laughs> All right, everyone. So we are going to wrap it up. And we don't have much to say except for one thing. Do tell. We've been getting a few comments here and there on YouTube from people mm-hmm. that are like, why don't you guys have more subscribers? Your stuff is great. <laughs> it's true, though. <laughs> and I keep seeing it. And I'm like, you know what, stranger? I agree. So if you're listening to this and you still haven't subscribed to us on YouTube, please go do that. Tell your mom, tell your friends, tell your dog, tell everyone, because it would be really cool if you did that, because we need more subs on there. Yeah, we're aiming for a thousand right now, but frick, like, we're aiming for the moon. So yeah, if you know someone that would like us, or if you like us and you haven't subscribed yet, please do so. It means the world to us, and it really does help us out a lot. But we're starting to get some traction on there, and I'd like to see it going. Hell yeah. All right, friends. Thank you all so, so, so much for listening. This has been the Grim Curriculum Extra Extra Credit. Credit.